Hey everyone, today I have a really interesting special episode because we're talking about summer camp. And I know that the past two years has been crazy and people, you know, have probably gotten an habit out of the habit of sleepaway camps and sleepovers and all of those things. And fortunately, at least right now, we're in the position where, you know, I think everybody can feel quite safe with the idea of returning to all these great activities that, that are important for connection and growth and families and everything like that. Um, and summer camp was always important to me. And today I'm talking with Natalie Roberts Day. She is the Associate Executive Director at Camp Kataki, which is the camp that I went to growing up. Um, it's halfway between here and in Omaha. And I just have the, the best memories from that. I was actually trying to find, you know, I like to do props and everything like that. My, my um, medal that I got after going five summers in a row, and I definitely could not find it, but our kids go there every year. Um, and I just wanted to have Natalie on to talk about the benefits of summer camp, because back in the day, it was a very commonplace thing. And I think with the way that sports has gone in particular and the never ending sports schedules that it's not something that's quite as top of mind for parents because it just doesn't seem like it's possible to pull them out of sports. But we know that there's a ton of benefits to camp Kata or just camp in general and camp Kataki if you're local. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit, Natalie, about the benefits that camp has to offer in general? Yeah, you know, I think a good way to think about the benefits of overnight camp is to compare it to other experiences that kids might have. And so sports camps is one, you know, they, they call them camps as well. And so we get kind of grouped into that sort of idea. But, you know, a sports camp is really focused on developing skills. And for us, we're really focused on developing kind of different types of skills, skills on how to be independent and autonomous out in the world, how to be empathetic, how to manage emotions. And there aren't a lot of programs and dedicated spaces that are just focused on your growth as a kid um, that doesn't have to do with academics or any kind of achievement and is just about having fun and about learning about yourself and the world around you. And we have so many great activities that kind of package those sorts of lessons. You know, when you are watching somebody at archery and you're cheering on your friend when they hit the bullseye for the first time, you are learning about empathy and what it means to live in community. Um, and it's not really about hitting the target. It's about that experience of being with peers and feeling supported and knowing that people are going to have you back. You have your back even when you fail. Um, and so those are, I think, in if I had to give a very brief summary of a little bit of what I see as what makes overnight camp special is just that chance to get away from everything that you know about yourself and the world around you as a kid and be kind of taken away from everything and get a chance to look at, you know, who am I and what am I doing out in the world? And I know that for a seven-year-old, that might not seem like a real, like, oh, that reflection happens in those ways, but we can see it. And I know for me as a parent, I see it in all of the different ways that I see my child grow when she comes, uh, comes back from a week of camp. Well, I think it's something that as we grew up, there wasn't quite the um, hovering attachment focus that we see with a lot of parents nowadays where they get their kids, not, not just like their, their quarterly report card, but they can see every assignment that they turned in and they know exactly how they're doing at whatever sport or activity they're doing because there's just this like constant data collection on our children. And then there's plenty of opportunities, way too many opportunities, in my opinion, for parents to then intervene or try and, you know, correct little um, mistakes or things where we, we get off track a little bit. And, and camp is like the antithesis of that. You just send them and you drop them off and you kind of unroll their sleeping bag on their, on their, on their bed. And then you say bye. And then you come back the next Saturday. Um, and so it gives children the opportunity to be, to get that self-confidence of like, I figured these things out on my own. Nobody was checking necessarily that I brushed my teeth or that I made, you know, ate all my food or things like that. It just seems like it's such an opportunity to grow independently as a child. 
Definitely. And I think, you know, one of the things that I love and I really highlight as a benefit is as parents, our job is to work ourselves out of a job in a lot of ways, but that's really hard. It's hard not to want to step in and and manage. And so to be able to say, I'm going to send you away to this place where you have to develop your own network of supports, my child. Um, And you know that you're sending them to a place that has those supports and, you know, has a really strong set up for success for your child, or at least our overnight camp, I like to think has that. Um, but it, it really is teaching your kid, you know, when you struggle, because we know kids are going to struggle with something, whether that's missing home, or whether that's time management in school, kids are going to have struggles, and we won't always be there to fix things for them. And so if we can show them how it feels to go into a space and have to look and say, okay, what adult can help me here? My usual adults aren't here. It's a great practice and it does build that sense of competence and confidence and esteem that leaves kids um, feeling taller at the end of the week or has has parents saying, you look taller at the end of a week because they can physically see that difference. And I think for parents too, it's, it's very much like, okay, I saw that my child wasn't calling home every hour. <laughs> I didn't have to like monitor their success or not at archery. They did the ropes course and they created these crafts and they made these memories with friends without me being a part of it. And I think that speaks to your working yourself out of a job. Like, wow, I didn't think my seven-year-old or my 12-year-old could handle those things because at home, they don't do those things. And I feel like I have to micromanage them, but they were just gone for six days without um, you know, me needing to intervene and they survived and thrived. Yeah, I think so often, um, you know, I tell parents and caregivers, you know, you are probably going to struggle more than your kid in a lot of ways, because we uh, have so many perceptions about all the things that can go wrong. And kids are just there, like, figuring it out and living their best lives and um, experiencing these positive near peer role models that help them figure it out. And it's just, it's neat to see. And I love the different ways that uh, uh, caregivers kind of report back to us things. Like, I can't tell you the number of times that parents tell me, what did you do to my kid? They didn't ever volunteer to sweep or to help like do the dishes. And now they get home from camp and they're just helping all over the place. And it's like, my kid is a completely different person. And it's just, you know, living in a community where you have to take a responsibility for, um, you know, even, even making your bed to make sure you win clean cabin as a cabin group right. <laughs> is a, an individual part of your experience, but it's something that if you don't do it, it's going to affect the rest of your group. And so thinking in that sort of um, community mindset is something that uh, I know a lot of parents kind of observe the benefits of that after camp ends. Well, I think that a lot of children aren't exposed to the sort of team mentality outside of the, the sports, because even though you're in a classroom with other kids at school, like your success at these math worksheets doesn't impact your, your colleague adjacent to you. And I think of it in the same way, like you spoke to of, you know, how they come back such a different child and they're willing to help out and do all those things. Well, it's because they got used to doing them because everybody else was doing them just in the way that I hear from parents of, you know, toddlers, like he eats so well at daycare, but he eats terrible for me at home. Well, he sees his colleagues eating green beans. He sees his colleagues sweeping the cabin and brushing their teeth and those sort of things. And then you start to do those things because it's just part of being in a social community. Mm -hmm, Definitely. So I think there's, there's some probably main objections or concerns that parents raise when it comes to sending their, their child away to camp. And I think the big one that that parents always fear, and it's been heightened by social media and different things like that is, um, you know, something bad could happen to my child from a relationship standpoint, from a child abuse standpoint. And you have a very um, long background as a crisis counselor for domestic and sexual violence uh, uh, victims. And so can you talk about, or how do you make parents feel more comfortable with that giving up of that control that they have when their child is at home versus a sleepover or a sleepaway camp? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things that I suggest parents kind of think about before they've even selected a camp. And one of the biggest things is um, any any overnight camp that you are going to send your kid to, if you call their director and say, tell me about what you're doing to prevent child abuse from occurring at your camp, they should 
be excited to talk to you about that. Like, I love it when parents call because I know it's on their mind. And so I right. love it when they ask and directors should have a really good answer for you as a caregiver that makes you feel like this is something that's really front of mind for them. So if you called my camp, um, we would explain to you that we train all of our staff and all of the campers to follow the rule of three so that there's no one-on-one -on -one time so that we are minimizing any opportunities um, for people to be in an uninterruptible situation. I would talk about all the different ways that we do background checks and I would highlight that we do a family reference check because we know from different data and statistics that the, if you have a close family member reference check, that person is the most likely person to tell you you shouldn't hire my my child, my nephew, mm. whoever it might be for this role if they do have a history of something concerning because the the caregivers of that potential staff member don't want to see that staff member get into legal trouble. And so sure. they are going to be the person who will do um, who, who will speak out in a way that maybe, you know, a, a regular job reference check might not. Mm. Um, and I would, you know, I would ask about like, what does your program look like? For us, we do a lot of things within our program where we are teaching about consent and training our staff to use the language of consent with kids. So before you're going to help a kid onto their horse or with their harness at the ropes course, asking, is it okay if I help you or doing other things, you know, get permission or ask them to talk through that using the language of consent when we are talking about behavior between kids. And so if a kid steals another kid's hat, you know, sometimes kids will be in kind of like a flirty way, like oh, I took your hat and I'm running away rather than just shut that down saying, Hey, did you ask permission to do that? Oh, okay. Well that affected somebody's life. And so you need to ask permission before you do something. Mm -hmm. And so teaching about consent in ways that has nothing to do with sexual violence or abuse, but that teaches kids, this is what adults with healthy intent and healthy boundaries look like in your lives. And so if they would ever get into a situation with a tricky adult who did have harmful intent, we talk to our staff all the time about how all of your interactions need to feel so wildly different than an interaction with a tricky person so that if a kid were in that situation, even years down the line away from our time at camp, they would hopefully remember, oh, when I was mm. in camp, the adults in my life did not treat me this way. They, in fact, prioritized having another person around so that I would be comfortable and not have one on one things. So like something feels off here. And hopefully that camper in their future lives would would recognize um, like I need to get out of this situation or I need to tell a trusted adult. And so those are some of the, the things that I would be looking for. Or like, like I said, some of the answers that I would give if you called me as the director of a camp. But on the other side of that, in terms of kind of how do you educate your child for any sleepover experience, you know, talking to them in ways that aren't necessarily fearful, but talking to them about how you should be able to have like a private changing space. You should be able to feel comfortable. Nobody should do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable or that like impacts your body without your permission and all of these different things um, that you can have in age appropriate ways and conversations, but so that kids know um, that they have, they have the power to say no to an adult. If an adult or a peer is doing something that they don't like, I think, sure. you know, a lot of times we give kids the message of like, you have to listen. And I think it's really important for kids to know like, yes, you have to listen. And there are times when you don't have to listen. And there are times when you can say no, and you can keep saying no, and you can find a trusted adult. And I think those are some of the, the lessons and messages that I would encourage parents to have conversations about before camp starts um, so that they are best prepared to, um, you know, be good advocates for themselves and their needs if they were in a situation that was tricky. Well, it sounds like what, I mean, it sounds like that concern from parents is probably, you know, that not only is it something that you all take very seriously and address, but it sounds like it's something where um, through going to camp that your child can be better prepared in the future for those situations and know how to advocate for themselves um, in those situations. Yeah, I really think there's a lot of potential in, in situations where you are saying, here is a different positive support and a positive role model. That's a really great opportunity to um, give your kids different pictures of what that looks like that aren't just mom and dad. You know, what do healthy adults who have good um, sense of boundaries and care about me and care about my needs and are friendly, but are still, you know, in charge and keeping me safe and managing my safety and my peers' safety in positive ways. 
What are some of the other questions that parents call in in advance of camp or when they're considering um, signing their child up for camp? What are some of the other questions that you hear on a typical basis? Oh, I think one of the really big ones that we get are questions about essentially like, is my kid going to make friends? And so everybody is worried that everybody comes to camp knowing everybody and their kid is going to be the only one. And, you know, we do have cabin mate requests, like kids are allowed to request a buddy, but most kids come knowing nobody. And so I like to talk to parents about all the things that we do starting as soon as your kid arrives to help make sure that they are making connections. So right away, we have time built into the start of our check-in time for kids to play name games and get to know each other, to talk about community expectations with their cabin group and kind of form some of those conversations um, to get an idea of like, how should we treat each other in this space? And then having a lot of just playing games and silly times and partnering when we're walking to activities to get to know people. And so, you know, I think parents really worry that they're going to have their kid come back from a week of summer camp, not having met anybody. Um, And that's, that's a fair concern. It's scary to imagine, like I go to a place where I know literally no one, there are very few spaces, you know, at school, you usually outside of first day of kindergarten, no people. And so it's intimidating. Um, But I think that we have so many supports in place to make that really easy, even if you're a kid who's really shy, or maybe socially lacks some skills. um, I think that we have a lot of great things because of our high staff ratios and things like that, that can help those kids who maybe need a little bit more support, really thrive and find their connections and find their place. Well, I think parents also forget like how easily kids will um, make friends. You'll like, I just remember like one of our kids telling us this elaborate story about how, uh, you know, his best friend and him did this and that at school. And I was like, oh, so what's your friend's best name? I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, they just jump in and it's so much easier. But you as a parent think about like how awkward it would be as an adult to like be thrown into this mix where you don't know anybody and just expected to like interact and all the layers that go with that. But the kids just don't have all those layers. They'll just jump into the, the situation and throw the Frisbee or chat it up with somebody about Minecraft or whatever it might be um, with no concern for any of the social things that go along with, um, you know, the awkwardness that comes with adults. Exactly, exactly. And then I think the other question that we get a lot are questions about kind of like kids specific needs. So my camper has a food allergy, my camper has a particular behavior need or a learning disability or whatever it might be. And so we just get a lot of questions about what does camp look like for for my specific camper. And, um, you know, I think the answer to that is we work really hard to meet the individual campers needs and work with those individual families. So, you know, food allergy is a really good example we serve a lot of kids with food allergies and other dietary needs. And so our kitchen is just really um, great. And I think seamlessly incorporating that into kids experience. Well, I can tell you that uh, a lot of my childhood memories revolve around camp. I did a couple, I mean, I did summer camp at Camp Kentucky for like most of my childhood. And then we did some of the, I know they have like year round things. So I remember doing a New Year's Eve thing and a Halloween thing there. Um, and, and so I just have so many good memories there. And then in the past few years, getting to go on Saturday morning to pick up our kids and hear the exact same John Denver music playing, um, as, as when we were getting picked up from camp, um, it's just been such a cool experience, uh, to be a part of. And I actually was a camp counselor at Camp Foster, which is a Y camp on Lake Okoboji. And so from, from my perspective, I'm just on board with camping, both as a parent and as a former counselor and as a pediatrician that I think it's just such a worthwhile experience. So what's the best thing to do if parents want to learn more about camp or, you know, find out if it's right for them and their family? Yeah, so you can always visit our website, which is ymcacampkataki.org. Um, the other big thing, like I said, is I always encourage parents to just give us a call. Um, we love answer, uh, answering specific questions and talking about your individual child's needs. And so I think, you know, that's a great way to connect with us. We have social media as well. So Instagram, Facebook, all of those sorts of things. You can see a little bit more about kind of what we're up to can see some of those year-round programs and things like that. We have a camp out coming up at April, a weekend-long event. That's our last one before summer. Um, and so those are a few of the chances to learn more. What's coming up big this camp this summer for, for Camp Kataki campers and everything like that? I feel like I saw on Instagram that the um, that there was some construction uh, going on in like the campfire area. 
So the campfire renovation was a couple of years ago that we had done that, but I think you're thinking of there are some rocks that are at the campfire area that we are using uh, to terrace an area that's kind of right by the basketball court there. Oh, okay, um, cool. But we do have some other new construction things coming on. We're going to be doing some bigger construction projects in the fall and some things. But every year we do a little bit of kind of tweaking and improving. And so we've always got a few fun new things um, to go on. But I think probably the biggest thing is just hoping to return to a little bit more sense of kind of normalcy this year. You know, we ran camp last year very successfully, but there's a lot of... um, adaptations that we had to make in order to make running camp successful and so we're excited to have you know a few more chances for kind of bigger camp activities and things like that than we maybe had in um, 2021. Oh my gosh I can't imagine how hard that was to and heartbreaking too for 2020 and 2021 to just not be able to serve families and campers in the same way as years past and I'm just so excited that things are like you said returning to normal and um, hopefully staying that way because there is so much that that you can gain from those experiences and our kids were heartbroken um, to not go and are so excited to get back. Some of the stuff that they talk about I'm not even sure like Fort Pawnee is a big thing that gets talked about at our house a lot and we actually have uh, apparently a sort of four part honey on our, our land, um, to it that, that mimics what it's like at camp. So there's just so many of those things that, that you think about. And I just think back on so many cool memories, um, two counselors that I remember, like remember from, you know, 30 years ago, Habano and Gonzo, who, um, were really cool camp counselors when I was there. Oh, uh, we are clearly like peers in a similar age because yeah. Habano, like, I remember Habano running archery and Gonzo yes, actually totally. ran the, um, the after school program. Like he worked for Kataki and then worked at the Northeast Y for a while. And so my middle school after school program was run by Gonzo and uh, I just look up to him a whole lot. So that's very oh fun. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's so funny. That is that. And I do remember the archery um, via Habano. And that was just like <laughs> the, I mean, those are things that stick with you. Obviously they stick with you um, because I remember them, you know, 20, 30 years later. And um, so I think that's another benefit to camp is just those memories that, that you can't replicate with any, um, anything that you can do at a sports, a regular old sports camp or playing video games all summer, anything like that. Um, yeah, so I, I don't highly know. Recommend. <laughs> I don't know if there's any um, gift that my parents ever gave me that I can like remember. Like I got like a Cabbage Patch Kid. I can remember that, sure. but that really like sticks with me. But I can remember like what it felt like for each of the times because camp was always my like big Christmas gift or whatever. And I have so many specific memories from that. And I think about when when I spend money and shell out money for gifts for my kid. I'm like are you going to remember or have any sense that I did this in a year? And I feel like right. camp is one that you know that they are going to have lifelong memories from just like you were sharing. So it's a cool. Oh, cool totally. Gift. I love it. Well, thank you so much. I will send everybody to the website and encourage them to check it out, figure out how to make camp happen for their family, because it is such an amazing opportunity. And I'm just grateful for all you do in our community as well. Well, thank you so much for all you do.